Well, hello and welcome to everybody out there. My name is Andrew. I'm on the staff team here at CCC. If this is your first time, you are especially welcome and it's great to have you here. If you want to find out a bit more about who we are and what we believe and how we aim to live our lives as Christians today in Dublin and around Ireland, do check out our website or have a look at the various links that will be popped into the chat over the course of the service today. Now, we aim to keep this service to an hour tops. Uh, we'll have a Bible reading, we'll have a talk, a bit of fun with an icebreaker, we'll have a few songs, some prayers, and also a, a chance to chat and to participate. Now, meeting on Zoom can be challenging, so we try to have a number of voices, keep things short and snappy, but I know I'm so thankful that despite the pandemic, we're able to meet here every week, have a bit of fun together and to learn more about the Bible and more about God. If there are a few hiccups along the way, please forgive us and we're all trying our best. Before we kick off, can I ask you to put away all distractions? The phone, the match, the thoughts of the week prior, or the thoughts of the week coming. and. If you want to with me just close your eyes for a few seconds take a deep breath in and a deep breath out be present for the next hour as we praise and learn more about our great god i'm going to hand over now to louisa um, on the welcome team hi everyone welcome to christ city church my name is louisa and I'm on the welcome team here. So if you're new today, you're especially welcome. Um, and I may pop you a message if I think you're new or if we haven't spoken before. So um, expect that from me. And also if you are new or you have any questions, feel free to um, find Louisa in the drop down chat and ping me a message and I'll try my best to help you out. Hope you enjoy the service today. And I'm gonna pass over to Justin now for our call to worship. Hey guys. Hope you're doing well. Listen, today we're going to be talking about worry. Anyone have any worries right now in their lives? Yeah. Worry is thinking about what bad thing is happening or what might happen and just worrying about it over and over just on repeat in your mind. It's just like the bad over and over. And I find that most of the time I worry the most when I'm not focused on God. And when I focus on God, I worry the least. And when I think about who God is, what he's done, how he loves me, how Jesus died for me, that he's in control, that God is enthroned, that nothing takes him by surprise, the things that I have playing out in my mind that I get so wrapped up in, they dissipate. And so I just want to take a moment before we get into worship, and I want us to settle our hearts and think about who God is. There's this text from Psalm 1, I can't, can't read on my screen here, hold on. from Psalm 107, it says this, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. There's another scripture that says, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so let's just pause for just one second and just think about God enthroned in heaven, perfectly in control, perfectly at ease, nothing surprising him. Thousands and thousands of angels at his call, completely in control, the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And then think about this. He really loves you. And as that weighs down on you, as you feel that and surrender to that, may it inform our worship today. Father, we love you so very much because you love us. God, I pray as we go into a time of, of worshiping through song, I ask that our hearts would be right before you. That if there's anything we need to repent of, God, any, anything, any sin, anything that we have, uh, have been doing or have done this past week, Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us. 
Lord, that we would come to you with clean hands and pure hearts because of the blood of Christ. And Lord, as we enter into this place together, I pray that our voices, though we're apart, would come together and enter into your throne room and that you would be happy as we worship you. We love you, Jesus. made me glad. Lord, thank you that we can be here together this afternoon on Zoom, join together in worship to, to lift up your name. Lord, I thank you that we can join many believers and the heavens today as we, as we lift up your name and sing your praises. My prayer that you draw near to us today as we draw near to you. Lord, there may be some of us um, today who are, who are anxious or who are going through a really tough time. And I, I, I thank you, Lord, that you say, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And as the song that we just say, sang say, you are my shield, my strength, my portion. Lord, I thank you that you, you give us rest, protection, and strength. I pray that you give us rest today as we, as we hear the message and as we draw near to you. Lord, you are greater than we can fathom, Lord, 
that you're also closer and more accessible than we can imagine. And we thank you for that. Lord, we praise you and we lift up your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vaughn. If you've joined us in the last couple of minutes, you're more, yeah, more than welcome. And it's great to have you here at our Sunday service. It's now time for one of my favorite moments of each week, and it's the icebreaker. And I think this is a, yeah, a particularly good one. If you may have noticed, if you've seen me before, that something has changed about my complexion this week. And yeah, I've fallen prey to another lockdown haircut. Um, this was actually a, a team effort by not, by not just my girlfriend, but also my two flatmates as well who joined in. Um, so I think from the front, it actually doesn't look too bad. But as soon as I tilt to the side, Isaac gave me some nice speed lines. And then the other side is just a bit of a dodgy fade. So we're going to run a poll now in a minute. Uh, I'm going to put out, there's going to be five different haircuts up on the screen. So um, let's see them. So we've got the Mohawk lockdown haircut. We've got the mullet. That's been a big one. We have just let it grow, beard, hair, just no haircut needed a year on. We have the speed line, as I modeled earlier, and also an eyebrow slit. So that's going to be a two for one. And then we have just a buzz cut, shave it all off. Um, so we have five very interesting haircuts. We're going to see who comes out on top. So there's going to be a poll that should pop up in your screen. You will be able to vote. And we're going to have a look at how it goes. We're going to pop it up there for maybe 20 30 seconds and see what's happening. Okay, so the mullet's taken out an early lead. Let it grow, slowly taking over. Speed line, an eyebrow slit, not doing too well at the moment. It seems like it's the mullet and let it grow, battling it out. We've had about half the votes in, 22 of 38. Let it grow still on top. Wow, let it grow, really, really coming down top with almost half the votes. Right, so we're going to leave it open a couple of more seconds. We still have some last minute votes coming in. Can the mullet pull it out from the bag? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Let's see. Oh, it's tight. Right, only a couple more people who could cast their votes. These could count, folks. These could count. Six more mullets need to take the lead. But unfortunately, I don't think they're going to do it. So... Let it grow. Well, maybe maybe it's a subtle hint that I need to uh, I need to take into account. So um, wow, amazing. Let it grow. That's that's the number one haircut that the people of CCC want to see. Um, amazing, amazing, great. With that, we're gonna move on to our first news item, and that is a happy Mother's Day to all the lovely and great mummies out there. Congratulations, everybody. You are the unsung heroes of so many lives, and you deserve much more than a Sunday in March. So, because you deserve much more, here is a brilliant joke. I bought my mom a mug which says, Happy Mother's Day from the world's worst son. I forgot to mail it, but I think she knows. So there you go. That one's for free. You, you, there you go, mothers. I hope you enjoy that. It's great to see my own mother on the line today, and she's here tuning in every week. Um, so a big shout out to her. Liz, I hope you enjoyed that great Mother's Day card that we made for you. Um, in particular, we, yeah, we want to wish all the mothers here at CCC a great day and hope your children bring you lots of chocolate and lots of cups of tea. So I'm going to hand over now to Mimi, who's going to bring us the next couple of news items. Sorry, um, I'm just trying to recover from that really bad joke there. I mean, oh, please don't, don't do that next year for Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so this week, um, tonight we're going to be having our social media seminar, um, and the seminar is going to be around, you know, the impacts that phones have um, during lockdown, because we are all texting and, you know, looking up everything to kind of keep connected within our community. So the, um, the workshop tonight, the seminar tonight, is actually going to help you navigate that in a healthy way and get tips on how we can be better with social media during lockdown and tell people about God using that. Um, then after this one, on the 21st of March, we are going to be having our living and renting in lockdown and beyond seminar. 
This is going to be in the evening at 5.40 to 6.40 p.m. Um, and the purpose of this seminar is to have a start, is to start the conversations on how we can live sustainably in lockdown and beyond, and potentially looking at the renting and buying options within Dublin. Um, so do come along, you know, and get involved in seeing how we can do better um, with our living um, statuses in Dublin. So that's next week at 5.40 to 6.40. Great, thank you, Mimi. The final notice this week is about an email that many of you will have received already, asking permission to plot your general location on a, on a Google map. Here's an example of how the map would work. Bob, Mary and Joe all live in and around Dundrum. So three pins without any names attached to them will be placed randomly in Dundrum town centre. So somebody viewing the map would be able to see, oh, look, well, three people in CCC who I don't know who they are, but they, they live in Dundrum. So maybe I'm looking for somewhere to ranch. I'd love to live near somebody in Dundrum. Um, I'm going to maybe try to find a flat there. So that is kind of how the map is going to work very briefly. There's a number of reasons we as a church want to do this. Well, firstly, it's to build community in our five kilometer um, areas. So, you know, we, we've really been restricted in distance, but it, it's great to know that some people in church live actually very close to you. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, yeah, so that people in CCC who are looking to, to move on, you know, can really consider, well, where are people in church based? Um, long term, where could I settle where I could be in place where there's lots of people in church and then finally it's just to help the church leadership make strategic decisions around church planting about starting a new church starting a new congregation a new service um, and seeing where you know potentially we, we could do that geographically so we value your data here at ccc and we've asked you via email permission for your general location to be plotted so please if you haven't already reply to that email as soon as we can as we'd be keen to use the map for next week's seminar as Mimi just told us. With that I'm going to hand over to Maeve who's going to read two passages from the Bible ahead of Steve's talk. Hi everybody, um, my name's Maeve so we're just going to read now. Um, we have a couple verses in Exodus 20 and then we'll finish in Matthew 6. Um, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your tents. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Then in, in Matthew 6, let's continue on. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And um, so we just pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the technology that lets us all hear them together. Thank you that these words, although written to a different generation, in a different language, in a different continent, they still are relevant to us and they still speak truth to our lives. 
Bless Steve as he speaks and let his words fall on all those who need to hear them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, lovely to, uh, lovely to be with you. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers on the, uh, on the call. Uh, you do amazing work. And um, yeah, the, the mullets, uh, uh, I'm glad that Let It Grow beat the mullets. Um, so we are spending the month of March reflecting on the ancient idea of Sabbath to help us answer many of our modern problems. Problems around hurry, distraction, emotional tiredness, lack of boundaries, mental health and burnout. I don't think it's just me because I think life for many people can feel relentless and exhausting. It's like we're on a treadmill. And, and, and we're trapped on it and we can't get off. So we just keep running and we just keep running. We want to get off. We're not sure how to get off. We're a bit scared to get off. So we just keep on running. Will it be okay to get off? How, how does one get off this relentless race of life? We're often not sure why we're running. We forget that. We're not sure for whom we're running. We forget that. And we just feel pressure inside of us and outside of us. It's just, just keep on running. And we're tired of running. In fact, our, our society feels tired of running. Even in COVID, where we have more time on our hands, supposedly, and we're less busy than we've ever been, supposedly, the tiredness has not gone away. If anything, the tiredness has increased. Why? Where does this tiredness come from? Well, the thesis of my talk today is that the tiredness comes from anxiety, not from busyness. It's not our busy lives or bored lives that make us tired. It's our busy hearts and our restless minds. There is a sickness inside each of us that needs to be cured. And today I want to propose the Sabbath is the antidote to our anxiety sickness. Sabbath is the way to deal with that deep tiredness we feel in our souls that comes from anxiety. Sabbath is the way to get off the treadmill. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be like a patient who goes to the doctor. We're going to visit our doctor, God, our Heavenly Father, with our anxiety and tiredness problems. And we're going to talk over the symptoms like you would with a doctor. We're going to ask the doctor to diagnose the root problem underneath them all. We're going to ask the doctor to prescribe us a solution. What is our medicine that we need? And we're going to ask the doctor to suggest some follow-up practices, some rehab, that needs to happen after we've been given our medicine to make sure we have long-term health. So let's start, well, I've already mentioned some of the symptoms in my introduction, so let me mention them more from a personal note. There were two moments in my early 20s when I vividly remember anxiety gripping my heart. Both were to do with fear of failure. The first was when I thought I was gonna fail a university exam. And the second was when I thought I was going to fail, in, in, in a sense, at giving my first ever evangelistic talk in a local pub in Leeds. I remember feeling sick and distracted and heavy. I was consumed by the anxiety as I considered I might fail and therefore be a failure. And I was so tired coming up to and particularly coming out of those two experiences. More recently, in my 30s, I can think of two other examples when anxiety gripped my heart. One was when I thought Annabelle might drown in a river uh, when we were on our sabbatical. And the other one was when I thought the world and my job and everything was just sort of going to go up in the air because of the COVID crisis. In these cases, it was not fear of failure that caused the anxiety, rather fear of losing control. And it scared me. And it was exhausting. It made me restless. It made me feel heavy. Those are two typical reasons why I can feel anxious. I wonder what it is for you. It might be fear of failure and fear of losing control like me. Maybe it's fear of rejection, fear of being known. You don't want people to know you. Fear of being taken advantage of because of something in your past. Fear of the unknown. Fear of never finding a life partner. Fear of social circles if you're an introvert. Fear of being alone in a kind of, if you're an extrovert and that's just a hard. Whoever you are, however it manifests, Anxiety wants to keep us running on the treadmill. Anxiety says you've never done enough and you are not enough and you don't have 
enough. So keep on running. Acquire more, produce more. Prove yourself. And it is exhausting. And our society is tired, isn't it? Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. The treadmill is tiring. Anxiety saps life out of us. And it stops us becoming the people God wants us to be. So those are the symptoms of our society. What's the problem? If you, our doc, we go to the doctor with all those symptoms. What does the doctor say? Well, our doctor, if it's Jesus, says this. The problem is you have a divided heart. That's the root problem, he's going to say. Now, we're going to get there. Stay with me. When God gave the Israelites the fourth commandment in, in Exodus 20, he did, you know, to obey the Sabbath, he did so in the context of his great rescue of them out of Egypt and out of from under the rule, the tyrannical rule of Pharaoh. Do you remember the Israelites were slaves in Egypt? Their, their, their parents had been slaves, their grandparents had been slaves, they'd always been slaves. And when Moses confronts Pharaoh and says, let my people go, Pharaoh says, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep your quota the same and I'm going to take away the resources. You have to produce more with less or produce the same with less. Egypt was an empire that devoured human beings one brick at a time for centuries. It was a pyramid. And Pharaoh was at the top of the pyramid and he was ravenous and hungry. So even when he had enough, we learn in the beginning of Exodus, he built store cities for all the extra that he had. Production and acquisition were the signs of that culture. And guess what, my friends? Slaves don't get a Sabbath. They work all day, every day, and then they die. That's the life of a slave. And Egypt is well alive in our hearts and our world. The obsessive desire to accumulate, to succeed, to become rich and powerful and secure, to have store cities for all the extra that we need to make sure we're okay. It's the foundation of much of Western life. Pharaoh would have loved modern culture and probably got to the top of the pyramid. So when God says to the people, and when God, sorry, excuse me, when God saves his people out of slavery, out of that relentless Egyptian system, out of the tyranny of Pharaoh's rule, and he says in the fourth commandment, every day, every week, excuse me, I want you to have a Sabbath. <gasps> Imagine how life-giving that must have sounded to people who had only ever been slaves. They'd worked without ever resting and now they were told you're going to rest every single week. Can you see the fuller implications of the Sabbath with that backdrop? The Sabbath was a, a declaration of satisfaction. We looked at this last week. We can enjoy the things we've done before we move on quickly to the next thing. We can stop and enjoy. The Sabbath was an act of liberation. It was a way of saying, uh, I, I, I'm going to celebrate my freedom. I've been set free and I'm not a slave to anyone and I'm going to revel and enjoy my freedom. That's the topic of next week. We'll look at that when we think of satisfaction. Thinking of today, the Sabbath was a declaration of true identity. All the other nations worked seven days a week. None of them had a day off. The Sabbath was a Jewish idea. None of the other nations had that idea. All the other nations worked, 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 worked. Your identity, your, your hope was secure in your work, not Israel. One day a week, God said to Israel, no, 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 your identity, your security is not bound up in your work. It's bound up in me. So spend a day reflecting on that. Work is not to be your, uh, your identity. And therefore, you shouldn't get anxious about your work or your achievements or your successes or your failures or how much you've accumulated or your money and power. Those things are not the be all and end all. On the Sabbath, you remember what and who you are running for and who is the be all and end all. And it's God. So stop and declare your true identity in him. And do you remember, oh, finally, the, the Sabbath is therefore an act of trust. Because do you remember the Israelites had to gather manna for six days of the week. But they had to gather twice as much on the sixth day so they were, could eat without working on the seventh day. In other words, they lived in dependence on God's provision, not their productivity. 
God was their provider and the Sabbath was a way of ensuring that their trust was in him and not themselves. On the Sabbath, the Israelites remembered who was the ultimate provider who was in charge of the world and it wasn't them, it was their God. In other words, the Sabbath is a day where you and I say, God is the one that really provides for my family. I know I feel that pressure with my kids every day. No, but God is the one that provides for them, not me. God is the one that keeps the ministry and the church going, not me. God is the one that means I have enough money, not my work. God is the one that means I have job security for the future, not how, how hard I work. God is the one that means my plans for the future may or may not come true, but it's not just my hard effort to secure them. Sabbath is a day when you say, I am not God and God is the ultimate provider and he's ultimately in control. So Sabbath was a declaration of satisfaction, an act of liberation, a declaration of true identity and an act of trust. As one scholar put it, it's an act of resistance to Egypt and an invitation to an alternative way of life. A life not defined by consumption, achievement, accomplishments, competition, performance and possessions. Let's not have that define us, it says. The Sabbath offered Israel a new identity and therefore a new way to live. Israel had to resist that way of life that they'd only known in Egypt. A life defined by work, quotas, production, efficiency, acquisition and progress. And they had to learn a new way of life. And what did God say the new way of life was to be defined by? Not efficiency, but loving God and loving your neighbour. So, we're at the doctor. We have a problem. We get anxious. Why? What's the root problem, the diagnosis? Like the Israelites, we so often return to our old slave masters to find our identity and control. Instead of trusting God, we trust our achievements, our savvy, our hard work. It starts off okay, but it's exhausting if you keep it up. The treadmill comes back. Instead of finding our identity in God, we find it in success or possessions or whatever else. And it starts off okay, but it's exhausting. We're back on the treadmill. What's the underlying problem under our anxiety and our tiredness? It's a divided heart. Whose am I? God or another slave master? Everyone has a master. Everyone is living for something that will control them, dictate your emotions and happiness and confidence. Everyone serves something that has the power to make you tired and anxious. So what's the solution? What does our doctor say the solution is? What's our medicine? Enjoyment of the rest giver, Jesus. And he's a master that doesn't drain us. He's a master that doesn't exhaust us. He's a master that doesn't say, I'm going to take away your resources and you have to produce as much like Pharaoh did. If the problem is a divided heart, then the Sabbath day was a day for taking sides. The Sabbath was a day for choosing your allegiance and your master. It was a day for getting off the treadmill and remembering who you're running for, why you're running and how to run joyfully. The Sabbath was a day for unraveling all those knots in your heart and unpicking all the stresses in your mind and giving them to God and saying, no, you're my identity. You're my provider. I'm not God. You're God. You run the world. I don't run the world. The Sabbath was a day for looking at our divided allegiances in our hearts and surrendering them afresh to God. And guess what? The moment you surrender your heart afresh to God, ah, you can rest, can't you? It's just so liberating to give everything that's in your heart to God and to give up control. The moment you realize you're not God, this is not your world, and you are not in control, that moment of surrender, that is the Sabbath, and it's liberating. It's life-giving. So what does Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened under Pharaoh in Egypt. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is clear. There is no yokeless life. 
something, someone will command our wills and require us to justify our existence. And all other yokes and all other burdens are heavy laden. The gospel is a yoke that is light and it doesn't leave you anxious or tired. He's saying, I'm the one you surrender to. I am the slave master who doesn't drive you into the ground demanding more from less. No, I'm a life-giving master. I'm, I will never drive you to the ground and crush you. Why not? I will be driven to the ground. I'll be driven to the grave and I'll be crushed. I'll be pierced for your transgressions. So you can rest. You can be justified. You can know forever that you're secure and that you are loved and that you have an inheritance. And there is nothing ultimately to worry about because nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. A Christian is someone who rests in the finished work of Jesus. And as they do, the tiredness and the anxiety dissipate. The work of self-justification, the work of controlling everything, you rest. You get off the treadmill because you're enjoying Jesus, the rest giver. So earlier in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus famously discourses on anxiety, he says it's all about allegiance in your hearts. Remember? He says this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. No one can serve both God and money. Figure out your heart, verse 24, if you figured it out. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do you see the logic? Once your heart is fully given over to God, you stop worrying. You have no reason to worry because he's your inheritance and any all your treasure is in heaven. And nothing can spoil it and nothing can steal it. And so the Sabbath day, in effect, is a day for saying, I am seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things that I think I need, they'll be added on to me. But today I stop and say, God, you're God, and I'm not. I'm enough because of Jesus, regardless of what I haven't, have or haven't done. I am enough regardless of my success or failure. I am enough regardless of how much I have in the bank account. I am enough regardless of whatever you want to put next that causes you to worry. So on the Sabbath, we enjoy our rest giver, Jesus. And therefore the Sabbath is an act of liberation because we surrender again to him. It's an act of trust as we give him control of our lives. It's a declaration of satisfaction as when we feast only on Jesus. And it's a declaration of our true identity as we say our work what I can achieve will not define me. What he has achieved for me defines me. And I, by faith, am going to inherit a throne of honour. The Israelites celebrated the Sabbath because Yahweh rescued them out of slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea. We celebrate the Sabbath because Jesus has rescued us out of slavery to sin and death through the cross and resurrection. And we celebrate by resting in him. We practice Sabbath by meditating on passages like Matthew 6 until anxiety is removed from our hearts through him. Jesus is the great physician who heals the divisions and sickness of our hearts. But as the great physician, he prescribes some rehab, some practices to make sure this isn't a one hit wonder. This is a long term sustainable way to live in our anxiety prone culture. As I said earlier, the Sabbath is an act of resistance and an offer of an alternative way of life. In other words, the pressures and the temptations that we can get sucked into the world's rat race, we can get pulled back on that treadmill. Pharaoh's control, we can serve an old slave master. We need to actively resist and actively choose an alternative way to live. And I wanna think about two practices for you. Every week, we're gonna give some practices. I want to talk about intentional surrender and intentional boundaries. Intentional surrender to practice the Sabbath as resistance and an alternative to the cultural narrative is to regularly surrender yourself to God, to give over control of your life to God, to admit the divisions in your hearts, 
and the allegiances in your heart, to confess your sins and your idols, to surrender your life again. Do that at the start of each day, giving your day to God, and do it at the end of each day, reflecting on all the actions and all the relationships and all that happened and all that was revealed in your heart that wasn't good, and give that again to God. If the Jews practice the Sabbath one day a week, then not only on the kind of daily rhythm of a Sabbath, we should think about a weekly rhythm of a Sabbath, not as a day off. Eugene Peterson calls the idea of a Sabbath as a day off, as a bastard Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a day off, it's a day of rest. Big difference. We saw last week, to really practice the Sabbath means planning, intentionality, forethought, structure. Even if your Sabbath ends up quite inactive and spontaneous because that fits your character and life, that's fine. But the Sabbath is a holy thing. It's a thing to delight in. It's not just a day off. And so once a week, take time to actively surrender your life afresh to God. And that is why corporate worship was an essential ingredient of Jewish Sabbath. Meeting together to worship God, singing, hear from God's word, corporate confession, centering our hearts on God. These are critical rhythms of our weekly Sabbath. And as we seek first his kingdom, he will add everything on that we need. So firstly, intentional surrender. Secondly, intentional boundaries. To practice the Sabbath as resistance and an alternative to the cultural narrative we live in is to create boundaries. A day when we create a circle around us, which means all the voices and all the demands and all the anxieties and all the tasks and all the emails and all the relentless social media content and news content and all the WhatsApp messages and all the work of our week. One day a week on the Sabbath, they are all told to halt, to stop. To stop. We need it, friends in our culture. It's relentless. You have to resist it. You have to have intentional boundaries. We're not at the mercy of these things. We will not be dictated to by these things. We're not enslaved to these things. We can say no to these things. So associated with the Sabbath laws were the gleaning laws in which the owners of fields were not allowed to harvest out the edge of their field, but were required to leave a percentage of grain in the field for the poor in the land to glean. In this way, the Sabbath practice includes deliberate limitation of our pro productivity as a way to trust God and declare our freedom from slavery. For me, I'm learning slowly, but I am learning it. I'm learning slowly to deliberately set fewer goals and tasks for myself in a given week or day as a way of not harvesting the edges of my time, energy and commitment. Because when I don't do that, Leanne and the kids get my dregs because I'm maxed out. God says, no, no, create margin. Of course, we can do that le legalistically in a way to prove and justify ourselves. But then our hearts will just be anxious and our minds still restless. We will have walked away from our work or our social media or from our WhatsApp or whatever it is we need to walk away from. And that's all we can think about because the Sabbath hasn't got into our hearts. And so the boundaries only make sense once the heart is surrendered and healed. Once Jesus, the rest giver, has calmed your anxiety, assuaged your guilt and spoken tenderly to your restlessness, only then can you cheerfully have a day of rest that you call holy and you call it a delight. And each day we make sure the boundaries are in place, particularly in lockdown. We must do this. In lockdown, the tendency for one thing to go to the next thing, and it all blurs into one, and there's no distinction in our weeks, there's no distinction in our days, there's no boundaries in our work, there's no boundaries in our online, there's no boundaries in our social, there's no bound. You can feel it, you can feel it. And it's worse in lockdown. Come to the social media seminar, we're going to think on it. So we need daily and weekly boundaries. When do I start work and when do I stop work? Okay, we have to be flexible, but as a whole, that's what we're trying to do. Screen boundaries. How much TV will I watch and how much will I be online and when will I turn the TV off and close the laptop? Phone boundaries. Will you start and end every day on your phone scrolling? Will you? You don't need to. You can choose not to. You can buy an alarm clock, put the phone in another room. You can put it on silent. 
For meal times, you can leave it on the side and you can stop the notifications so that you're present with other people rather than being distracted by your phone. You're not being pulled away the whole time by the beeps and the buzzes. A vital aspect of Sabbath in modern culture, in my opinion, is to have sorted out the notifications on your phone. What am I going to allow to interrupt me at any point? For me, it's just text messages and a phone call. And my phone is set to grayscale, so it's not very attractive to me. I don't want to click on it the whole time. Now, listen, I enjoy Twitter. I enjoy WhatsApp. So it's about having boundaries. Another thing, multitasking. You need to have a boundary in that the Sabbath is a day for depth, for focus, for enjoyment, for delight, for concentration on one thing or one people group. It's not a hundred things and busy running around. It's a day for enjoyment and to enjoy something, you've got to stop the multitasking and be present in the moment and get rid of the to-do list for a moment. I said to Leanne yesterday, should we put up those mirrors? We got some mirrors and she just said, no. I was like, yeah, you're right. We won't today. And you need to put boundaries on your prayer and your Bible. In other words, you've got to make sure you know, when am I seeking God's face? How am I doing it? And how am I going to get rid of all the distractions so that I can do that? And again, stage of life and all those things have to be taken into account. And then on top of those weekly and daily boundaries, we need to think about monthly, termly and yearly boundaries. I talked about this last week, but it's so important. We have to have planned time for recreation and avocation or rest. What was that? I remember it's deliberately and concentratedly doing something that you immensely enjoy, but it takes effort, but you're not trying to achieve or acquire anything. You're just trying to enjoy and focus and delight in something of God and his gifts to you. It means planned retreat days, half a day off here, a day off there where you have no other agenda but to pray, to study the Bible, to read, to reflect, to journal, to walk, to be still. Do you have those? Israel had them. And planned holidays, again, where you put boundaries on your work, on your screens, on your phones, on your multitasking. Friends, the pull of Egypt is great. It's a pull that starts in our hearts because we want to self-justify, acquire and produce. But it's reinforced by our society and it makes us anxious and tired. We must find rest in Jesus, the great physician and his gentle heart. And intentionally create boundaries, both as a sign that we have found rest in Jesus and a way to increase our rest in Jesus. Now more than ever in lockdown, we are realizing the issue isn't busyness or boredom. The issue is our hearts. And now more than ever, we have to learn that if we don't plan our rest, we will be sucked in to an endless, monotonous, tired, anxiety and complaining world. Let's not be pulled in by that slave master. So like Israel, let's have different periods of sevens and different festivals where we go, this is our rhythm. This is our God. This is our identity. And we will not serve any other master but Jesus. And therefore, we don't have to worry. We seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added on to us as well. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for how quickly we desert you to serve other masters. Forgive us of how quickly we feel we need to produce and we need to acquire and we need to accumulate and we need to compete and we need to perform. Lord, forgive us for falling into the big pyramid that is Egypt. Thinking that somehow we secure our future, that we're in charge, that we've just got to keep going. Forgive us, Lord where that all springs from a self-justifying spirit. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to do all the work that was required and you were driven into the ground, into the grave. You were crushed for our iniquities so that we can rest from self-justification, rest from that sense that we haven't done enough or don't, don't have enough. We can rest in you. We thank you, Jesus, that you come to us and you say, listen, I'm not a nasty slave master who's going to grind you to the ground. You say, my heart and my way is lowly and gentle and kind and I'm for you. And you want to take our heavy burdens off our backs and you want to put them on yours so we can live lightly. 
So free our hearts, Lord, from those idols, those things that we, we live for that just sap us of energy and cause us anxiety. And may we, like the Israelites, learn, or oh, they, were, they were bad at it, Lord. <laughs> they were bad at it. But may we learn to revel in our freedom, to enjoy the freedom that you've won for us. And help us, Lord, with the, just regularly, daily, weekly, yearly, to surrender afresh our lives and to put those boundaries in place that say Jesus is the only master we serve. Lord, give us great wisdom in our day of relentless information, relentless connectivity during lockdown where it can even feel more monotonous and relentless. Lord, give us wisdom and your grace for these things that Jesus may be glorified and we may love you and love our neighbour, which is what you are all about. We pray that in your name. Amen. doing this is a slightly new song um, we've done it once before so we'll just do the first verse twice to get more familiar with it all these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Let's sing so all these pieces All these pieces Broken and scattered In mercy gathered Mended and whole Empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me And oh, I once was lost But now I am found Was blind but see oh I can see you now I can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to You take our failure, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Amazing grace, how sweet. Saved a wretch like me. Oh, 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 I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. I can see the Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, 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 I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see, oh, I can see. see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to life I can see you I can
can see you now. I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the broken to Dear Lord, yeah, help us to pause, Lord. Help us to pause this this Patrick's Day, Lord, this weekend, this this month, this year, and to see you for who you are, Lord. As Vaughn said, Lord, I pray that you take that time where we draw near to you to draw near to us. Lord, I thank you that when we worry, when we feel anxious, we can come to you. You you ask us, Lord, you invite us, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, help us when we ignore you. And when we run to other things for that rest, Lord, uh, where we fill our baskets with far too much, Lord, where we take and take and take. Lord, help us remember those lines for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And I thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, as Maeve said earlier, this message for the Israelites all those years ago is still so relevant for us today, Lord. Help us. Yeah, to find that identity, to find that trust in you, Lord. I pray that we can put those in that intentional surrender, Lord, that, that those intentional boundaries, we can put those into practice. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you change our hearts, that we'll want to rest in you. We'll, we'll want to have a Sabbath where we spend all day resting in you and worshipping you. Thank you, Lord, that we're no longer slaves, Lord, that we don't have to be slaves to anyone but you lord we don't have to have slave masters from work from relationships from commitments lord thank you for that amazing news amen 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 well this is the end of our formal time together everyone and, and a big thank you to all who helped organize and, and run the service today There'll be a song playing in the background and for the next couple of minutes uh, and that means you've some time to decide whether you'd like to head off to the social media seminar it's on a different zoom the links in the chat there so that's one option you have another option is you could stay on this zoom and have a catch-up in breakout rooms for about 10 minutes after the service i'm going to be there or you might just want to head off and get munching on your dinner all three are great and viable options Whatever you choose, it's been great having everyone here together and I hope you all have a fantastic upcoming week, a great Mother's Day, a great Patrick's Day and I hope you all take care. Bye for now.